My name is Graham Manley. I'm head of the department and consultant special care dentistry at the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability. I've been um, working in the area of treating people with disability for um, since 1980 and more specifically at the Royal Hospital for about 15 years. The presentation is about the oral health of people with Huntington's disease, the problems that might be faced, uh, what are the problems for dentists in providing care, and how hopefully we can work together to overcome these problems. One of the main difficulties um, in this area is there isn't very much research into the area of oral health and HD. Um, there are a number of case studies, um, and although clinical experience and observation is valuable, one has to be cautious about this um, because there are obvious variations between individual people. Um, there is very little strategy in the way of providing care and policies, although the Standards of Care or Health Group, which was part of the European Huntington's Disease Network, worked on this and uh, established a policy to address these problems and actually to give some guidance for dentists uh, on and also everybody else involved in the area um, on how to address the problems. Um, there has also been a specific research project carried out by a colleague of mine, Helen Lane at Putney Hospital, and I can refer to this um, as part of the presentation because it gives some indication of the situation. This is, is a poster really um, outlining about the guidelines or health people HD. Uh, there is a reference at the top should you want to look at it in more detail. It's quite an old reference, uh, 2012. However, uh, most of the um, actual aspects of it are still remain strong. Uh, what we know about Huntington's disease and oral health is um, people with HD um, will present with dental decay, dental caries, and gum disease. However, it can't be assumed, it isn't assumed, that a condition of HD makes the teeth or the gums more prone to disease. The condition doesn't make the teeth inherently weaker. However, the condition of HD does pre present specific problems in the prevention and treatment of oral disease. And these problems, as you can, I'm sure, well imagine, become more complex as the condition progresses. I hope you don't mind me referring to Huntington's disease as HD. It, um, okay. Um, some of the problems are, are relating to specifically to HD are dry mouth, which is, can be caused by citalopreme and olanzapine, the medications taken, uh, mouth breathing, um, the diet. Uh, very often, a high sugar content is recommended to enhance the calorie intake and eating also often. So these are problems that we would face as dentists. Um, in, in terms of oral hygiene, um, calculus deposits, that deposits of tartar on the teeth are increased if a person is peg fed, that is fed through a tube in the stomach. Um, and this in itself is not always a problem, but it, it does somehow appear to be so. Gum disease management is a problem in terms of oral hygiene, if you carry out effective oral hygiene. Um, soft tissue, lip, tongue, and cheek trauma through uncontrolled movements of the mouth and biting, and also untreated dental decay, dental caries management. That is, how do we treat somebody um, who has extensive dental decay? And of course, finding a dentist, which is something that you may um, have issues with or questions about. Um, in terms of Helen Lane's project, um, she looked at a total of 35 adults with advanced stages of the condition. Some had natural teeth, five without any teeth at all, the dentulous. 20 out of the 30 required some dental treatment, so it's quite a high level of treatment required. 32 uh, were presented with one or more medications to cause a dry mouth. Dry mouth is a problem because the saliva um, is something that, um, in, in a simple term, washes the teeth and uh, keeps the uh, foods and everything away. So dry mouth can be a problem. There were three times more decayed teeth in adults of comparable age. Uh, 2.6 fewer teeth in adults of the comparable age. Um, and 50% of the chewing teeth, that's the back teeth, um, were lost. Uh, there was significant evidence of injurious soft tissue trauma, lip, 
height and time, although she didn't say exactly how many. Um, problems in obtaining dental care, there are three aspects really of this, accessibility, availability and acceptability. And I would hope, and this is one of my underlying principles, that as a dental profession, we work towards uh, the fact that the care and treatment should be of no lesser standard to that which is provided for a person who does not have HD. And um, I hope to be able to illustrate this by a video um, a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, dental care and treatment should be provided as part of a multidisciplinary team. At the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability, we have um, a very extensive multidisciplinary team, um, ranging from physios, occupational therapists, um, music therapists, uh, medical staff, nursing staff, obviously, and we, we do work very closely with them. Um, dietitians is another group and speech and language therapists. Um, so the provision of safe oral care and treatment should be appropriate to the various stages of the progression of the disease and within the context of the presenting condition. It should be safe, sensible and also pragmatic. Um, this is something in the EHDN um, policy that we focused on, that the, the care and particularly the treatment is, is relevant to the stages of the progression of the condition. Um, the prevention of oral disease is essential and should be emphasised at the early stage. Prevention is really the key to everything to do with this. Um, I would be very happy just to sit in my surgery or the office having a cup of tea for most of the day and not seeing any patients because they have no, no disease. Um, I probably wouldn't be employed, but then that would be the ideal situation in many ways. Um, so prevention, as with everything else, is the key and um, can't emphasise that enough. But in terms of treatment, we aim to be able to prevent a similar uh, standard of care and treatment to those who do not have the condition. Um, these are the different people involved at um, our Rural Hospital for Neurodisability, and it's all lovely and nice seeing this um, diagram. However, what we really want to see is this. We need to um, have an exchange between the different people rather than just have lots of different people going their separate ways. Um, and I'll refer to how we do this in dentistry and at the RHM also a little bit later on. Um, <clears throat> the very important thing about prevention and care is working with, with carers. And um, Helen uh, interviewed the carers and got some questionnaire results from them particularly about their training. Did they feel able to cope with helping out with the oral health care? 40, nearly half of them had received training about oral health in the, in the past, but none within the past year. So that definitely needed updating. And 95%, a lot of them, most of them wanted regular updates. This is an issue that we have now turned our attention towards and are working on and improving. Um, she had a list of... Um, called assessment tools really, but they were just a list of aspects of oral health care that um, really um, focused the carers on what they thought, thought was important and what they think they thought they should do. And one of the things was healthy and healthy mouth indicators. Um, some of them, so this was really a list of priorities. Gingival or gum condition was towards the top of the list. Bad breath or halitosis was also fairly top. And strangely enough, pain was fairly low on the list. Whether this was because of the fact that it was difficult for the carers to um, actually determine whether the person uh, was having pain or not uh, could have been part of the reason for this. Um, you have to bear in mind that these are people with HD who are in the very advanced stages of the condition and are unable to express um, feelings of pain or discomfort through um, language um, voice. Um, some of the difficulties um, they had in providing mouth care was access, um, getting into the mouth um, effectively, carefully and considerately, um, refu refusal by the patient. Um, they were also worried that the person with HD might um, aspirate, that is take some of the toothpaste or the water into their lungs during the process and not be able to control this. Also, they felt that they were um, they may be causing discomfort or pain through toothbrushing 
and uh, they also felt that um, they needed slightly better equipment, toothbrushes, maybe electric toothbrushes or smaller toothbrushes or softer ones. So there were a number of issues that carers raised and I think they're all important and I hope we have gone some way to address them. Um, some of the oral hygiene aids are listed here. Um, I have to say I'm not a great believer in the mouth expander. Um, this is something that can be used. It's a plastic gadget which just kind of fits around the lips upper, upper and lower and holds the mouth open. Um, I don't think the tolerance is always very good. Um, the second one is in large grip, um, which can make it possibly a little bit easier um, for the person to hold. And the third one is the oral bite support, which is can be used by carers um, just to keep the mouth open. It's like a soft, um, firm rubber wedge, which goes in between the teeth and um, some carers have found that have requ requested something like this, but it's, it fits um, on the flat bit. You can see there's a, uh, an opening on the other side which you put your finger through um, and the, the other bit that's sticking up goes in between the teeth. And so there is a uh, concern that if your finger comes out and it becomes loose in the mouth, then it can cause a problem with swallowing. I'm not a great fan of the also um, by support. Um, I'm sort of reasonably adept at um, getting my fingers out of the way if a bite is coming near them. Anyway, um, these are some of the oral hygiene toothbrush tools that have been recommended. Uh, the Collis Curve toothbrush you can see is, is a, a bristles on either side and one centrally, and you can see it probably clearer in the Barman's one, uh, although we tend to use a Collis Curve because they have smaller brushes. So in effect, the bristles are uh, surrounding all the surfaces of the teeth, and this can be helpful. Uh, the aspirating toothbrush, which is connected up to um, such suction line on the wards or wherever, um, removes the excess of saliva during toothbrushing. You obviously have to have such equipment to be able to use this, and it's more probably appropriate within hospital situations than the home situation. Um, the various um, Toothpaste that you can get, um, well, I say you can get probably through your dentist, is a high fluoride toothpaste, the Durafat, flies out 5,000 parts per million, um, which is intended obviously to uh, prevent dental decay. You can get fluoride mouthwashes as well, but they may be more difficult to um, cope with because of uh, coordination, mouth coordination. Um, saliva replacements in the sprays and gels. This is something that um, can be used to combat the effect of dry mouth. Uh, this is another thing that I have to admit I'm not terribly um, keen on, mainly because of the fact that unless they are um, checked fairly regularly and replaced and cleaned off, then they can form a fairly um, sort of sticky and hardened surface on the tongue and on the palate, um, which if it becomes very hardened, is quite difficult to remove. It can't be removed by a toothbrush, it has to be removed by a dental surgeon using tweezers. And this is something that's very unpleasant for the person um, if, if the saliva replacement and gels are not managed um, properly. Um, the, the, the one underneath is um, chlorhexidine toothpaste. Um, now, the, there are various um, different brands on the market. Um, I'll mention this one here, Perio King, which is a low percentage of chlorhexidine. The one that you may well have seen in the shops is Corsodile, um, Corsodile Dental Gel or Corsodile Mouth Rinse, which has a higher percentage of chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine is an antibacterial agent, which um, essentially is, a, is targeted the um, bacteria in the plaque uh, to reduce their amount and their efficacy and so the plaque becomes less um, worrying and th that prevents um, helps prevent gum disease it doesn't prevent gum disease entirely but uh, it has to go along with careful toothbrushing but it can help um, the two <coughs> excuse me that i mentioned corsodile dental gel has got a higher chlorhexidine um, um, percentage that's not particularly worrying in any way. It's completely safe 
although um, taste is uh, a recognized problem when you're using this. If you ever have some at home in the cupboard or whatever, uh, you might want to try tasting it. And I don't think you'll be that impressed. Whereas the Periokin um, has got a much more acceptable taste. We found this with our patients and not just a personal thing. Um, so uh, you can, uh, something I should perhaps mention. Um, however, um, you are, Periokin may not be well known by uh, your average high street dentist. It may well be, I don't know. But you can get hold of this if you go on the Jolly Old website. I've done this and I've found it and you can, you can buy it from the website on various companies. So if you're going to use chlorhexidine, um, then uh, my, I would favor the use of periokin personally. Um, treatment, when we get to treatment, having said the importance of prevention, I'll just um, come on to the very important also part of treatment. Um, in terms of treatment, the planning of oral health care must be uh, pragmatic, I feel. <clears throat> um, we have to be aware of the fact that if we offer certain aspects of care, they need to be um, maintainable and they need to be practically, um, in fact, practically um, provided by the dentist and also practically um, practically um, supported by the carer. Um, so if we get involved in extremely complicated dentistry, um, then that may well be something that um, is not in the overall interests uh, at a later stage of the condition. Having said that, I'll probably counter that argument entirely by showing you um, some video later on. Um, in terms of providing treatment, the use of conscious sedation is an essential management strategy. Um, conscious sedation is exactly what it says. It's providing a sedative agent. Um, usually um, the one that we use is by the intravenous use, use route. <clears throat> so that involves inserting a small cannula in the back of the hand or the arm and they're very slowly titrating an amount of the drug. And midazolam is the drug that we used, such that a state of um, consciousness is achieved, thereby allowing treatment to take place. Um, this is not a general anesthetic, I would stress that, and it's not deep sedation, which is another um, level further on. It can be provided by a dentist as um, providing the sedation and completing treatment, assisted by a trained dental nurse, dental surgery system. Um, this is an aspect of care that I'm a firm believer in and have championed over the years, and I would like to illustrate you a little bit later. Um, the treatment that we provide should take into account the comfort and the safety um, <coughs> aspect, particularly to protect the airway, which may well be compromised and less possibly less effective uh, in the more advanced stages of a condition. <clears throat> in terms of the um, results from Helen Lane's project, five out of the 20 were treated successfully with local anesthetic alone, which is good. Um, it's a, a simple, straightforward technique as you would get in any um, dental practice. Um, 12 out of 20, it's a high percentage, were treated successfully with sedation, which I've just recently been described. Um, sedation can reduce involuntary movements and also facilitate high quality dental treatment. Um, three out of the 20 were referred for treatment under general anaesthetic. And this is something that I um, also feel strongly about. We need to have good contact with um, tertiary hospital sites who can provide this sort of care should it be required. Um, although we can provide treatment with local anaesthetic successfully for some, and also conscious sedation in the dental surgery, in the dental practice, um, there are, uh, this does, as everything in life, this does not always work and we need the support and backup um, from the hospital service um, for treatment under general anaesthetic. Um, in London, we are fortunate as having a, a number of dental schools, um, Guys and Kings, the London Hospital in Whitechapel, 
and also Leesman um, <clears throat> to be able to refer to all these places, these dental hospitals have specific departments um, caring for people with disabilities and they provide also a service of treatment with using sedation and general anaesthetic. So um, that would be a place of referral by your local dentist should um, that be required. Um, in terms of treatment uh, at the Royal Hospital, we have um, a wheelchair recliner or wheelchair tipper. Um, you can see the image on the on the left or left of my screen of a gentleman um, in a wheelchair um, reclined to a position where treatment can be carried out. And on the right, you can see what it looks like in the dental surgery without the wheelchair on. <clears throat> um, personally, I find, although you might think that the, the, the gentleman who's in the wheelchair, who's actually agreed to be filmed and everything, um, is a little bit vulnerable and not perhaps safe, um, you, there's no way that the, the chair can go backwards or fall out or either way. Uh, my feeling is that to recline it completely in a position where the dentist is able to sit for treatment um, makes, I would, uh, in my view, it makes the, the person in the chair, the patient, feel a little bit more vulnerable. And I tend to treat uh, patients more in this type of position, uh, but by standing up. That's not something that's really recommended for a dentist. However, we have to bear in mind completely what's comfortable for the patient. So this is one way um, that um, people with um, HD can be treated without moving them out of their wheelchair. If you want to put them in a dental chair, if they need to be in a dental chair, the, this um, is an item of, um, I don't think you should call it bedding, but it's a cushion, um, an all-in-one cushion, and basically place it in the dental chair and it molds to the shape of the body. So, and it's a, like a soft, a foamy type material. So it's, I've actually sat in one of these and they're very comfortable. So that's another um, uh, bit of equipment that your dentist could use um, in, the, in the standard dental chair. Obviously this requires some um, trans lifting and transferring and ha manual handling to the dental chair. And um, this is something that the person with hunting disease may not be comfortable to be lifted, um, particularly in the latter stages. Um, so the wheelchair tipper is quite a, a very good ideal option, I think. Some of these things I've, I've raised are, are difficult, um, but I think we can overcome them um, with the right approach. And I think the right approach is for us as dentists to be positive and to be flexible about the situation, and particularly to, to bear in mind uh, the needs of the person with HD and whatever we can do to help address these needs, we should do. Um, so this is, uh, just show you, I talk a little bit about clinical situations, and this is a, a clinical problem um, that uh, we have several clinical problems at Putney Hospital. Um, this is one of a gentleman with advancing stages of the condition who um, has also a fairly advanced gum disease. Uh, you can see there's a gap between his lower front teeth. Um, he had four lower incisors there, which were very loose, and um, I was able to remove these using conscious sedation without any trouble. Um, he was very comfortable with that procedure, and um, it wasn't a difficult thing to do. Um, however, um, once everything was healed up, he was not happy about the fact that he had the gap there. Um, he particularly wanted uh, to have the gap filled so he could find it easier when he was going down the pub having a drink with his friends and also find it easier uh, when he was holding his cigarettes. So <clears throat> because of the fact that this gentleman had fairly significant career movements, we felt that providing him with a lower denture, um, lower removable denture, uh, would create something of a problem in terms of the fact that he may um, dislodge the denture through tongue movements 
and then it could be swallowed or even worse, um, go down the wrong tube towards his lungs. So this is something that um, we wanted to avoid, obviously, completely. The only other two options were to provide an implant. Um, you can't see from this slide, but he doesn't really have very much lower bone in which to sink implants um, into his lower jaw. In addition, that's something that I am not trained in and wouldn't do. Um, so that was out. The final one was to provide a, 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 um, a prosthesis uh, to fill the gap, um, which is permanently fixed to the two teeth either side. Um, I'm sure I'll be sh probably sure you know this is called a bridge. So um, we, I don't think my pointer works. So what we aim to do was to make a bridge to fill the gap. Um, which would be permanently fixed. Luckily, the two teeth either side of the gap, which are canines, tend to be very strong, and they weren't actually that loose. Um, and although the gum condition around them wasn't ideal, um, it was considered favourable to do this. So because of his correct movements, we considered um, we would do this in sedation. And um, this is a gentleman in question who we spoke to at length and discussed the whole thing and discussed whether he would be happy for us to film this and to be use it in presentations and to be use it in publications. And um, this is what he said. And this photography will be shown to other dentists at the conference and on other occasions, and also will be used with Helen's project. Is that okay with you? Oh, it sounds like it. A project is to is looking into the treatment of people with hunting disease. Uh, okay. Is that all right then? You agree to that, do you? Yeah. Thank you very much, Ray. Okay, so no, he agreed to it verbally. We had witnesses and also a carer in the background, and he signed a consent form. So I think we addressed the whole thing properly. We didn't force him to do it, and I I have shown this to undergraduates and also postgraduate colleagues as part of the training. And what I emphasize the fact is that uh, Ray is a lovely gentleman and he wanted to know about Helen's project, he asked about it. So um, that the, um, all these youngsters first coming into this area of dentistry should not assume that because somebody has career movements and it's condition, they're not able to um, carry out a conversation, uh, a coherent conversation and be competent and um, decide these things for themselves. So anyway, having Ray decided on this, uh, we then, um, this was Helen who was actually providing the sedation. We went ahead with uh, providing the sedation. And th there she is giving the first doses of midazolam. I shouldn't be talking over this really. Um, that's a pulse oximeter that measures the oxygen saturation. So that's one of the objective ways that we assess whether the person who's having the sedation is safe. Um, the, the oxygen saturation must not drop beneath a level of 90%. Two milligrams? Two milligrams? One. One. Okay, she's given one milligram. She's done it very, very slowly um, just to be careful. This is something that we need to do. We need to be careful. You can see that to actually provide, um, to do the dentistry, to provide a bridge for this gentleman with his movements would not have been safe. Give him a little bit more. You can see the effect of the drug. It's causing the correct movements just to wash away. Are you doing that? Okay. How much is that? Two milligrams. Total of two. A little bit more. Sorry.
And a focus on the pulse oximeter to show you that the oxygen saturation is 96% and the heart rate is 67, which is all very stable. A total of three milligrams. Now, just to reassure you that um, th this is conscious sedation, and although the next slide that you'll see looks as though the patient is anaesthetized, uh, he certainly isn't. He's still able to respond, not verbally, but in terms of um, various reactions to touch and to pressure, um, and he's also able to move his head. But the next slide. We'll just show you Helen actually doing the treatment. She's preparing the teeth either side of the gap uh, so that the crown can be fitted on the teeth either side of the gap. And um, attached to the crown would be uh, the bridge, which would be false teeth made out of porcelain infused to gold. This is a standard bridge preparation, a fixed, fixed bridge preparation. And this is not a great slide but you can possibly see i don't know if a pointer comes out that the lower gap is now filled with a bridge whoops now let's just go back a big smile then there that's you go. good see a bit better there um so he was quite happy with the end result and he was able to um, have a nice drink down the pub and hold his cigarettes and um it was generally considered to be fairly successful. So this is an example of us providing um, the same standard of care to somebody with HD even in the advancing stages as um, to somebody who doesn't have the condition. Um, I was saying earlier on in my presentation that we should bear in mind um, that we don't provide care that um, is um, difficult for the person to manage and the latter stages of the condition. And this is an example where we've actually gone against that recommendation. However, sometimes we have to, um, we have to um, exercise a degree of flexibility in our professional decisions. Probably the purest dentist would say, this, this gentleman is unable to clean his teeth perfectly. So I'm not prepared to put a bridge in that situation uh, because to, to have a bridge, you really need to be able to clean your teeth very, very, very well, perfectly, in fact. Um, however, um, my point about being flexible earlier on holds, and I think this is something that um, we need to bear in mind we treat when caring for people, providing dental treatment for people with disability and obviously with HD as well. Um, this is a slide just to show, we're talking about multidisciplinary care, that using conscious sedation, uh, we have been at the hospital able to um, aspects of care um, while dental treatment is being provided or dental treatment is being provided and then um, the other aspects of multidisciplinary care are also provided. So uh, trimming the toenails is one, um, the, the medics and the um, physios assessing the limb movement and um, changing a peg. Somebody who um, would previously have to go to St. George's Hospital to have their peg changed. This was done at the hospital while we were providing conscious sedation and doing some dental examinations and treatment. And the peg was changed, providing a haircut and shave. Um, the gentleman who um, needed to have his ear syringed and the ear wax removed. The ENT consultant came along and we were able to do this. We provided the sedation on the ward because this particular patient was quite challenging, carried out a dental examination and a clean, and he had his ear wax removed and obviously taking blood. Um, this was taken from the foot because this particular gentleman was rather lively. Um, the foot was the uh, better option to go for. So, this is just illustrating how we work in a multidisciplinary team and how it's important to do that. Um, these, most of these examples are 
um, some of them are just examples to demonstrate what we can do. Um, but we can also do this with people with Huntington's disease. Uh, another clinical problem is um, relates to abnormal oral responses that may result in uh, lip trauma or tongue trauma. Um, this is a particular problem that we're faced with. And um, although it's diff it's, you, you can construct uh, mouth guards, and you can see the one on the right-hand side of the screen, which is a lower mouth guard, which supports the lips and keeps it away from the tongue. Uh, the problem that we face with this is that the mouth guard may not be tolerated, um, first of all. Uh, it also may not be stable in the mouth because of the excessive tongue movements. Um, and if it's not stable, it can present, a, a, again, a risk from swallowing or even worse, inhaling into the lungs and aspirating. <clears throat> so often this can be controlled with um, general um, care to the soft tissues, to the lips, um, by using um, a form of mouth rinse. Um, also, it can be controlled and has been in the past by using Botox injections. And this is something that we do at the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability. Um, Diflam is usually the choice for um, spray or mouth rinse to control this sort of inflammation, and it can be very helpful. Um, just talk a little bit about the dilemmas and decisions for the dentist, patient, and carer. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier on that particularly people who are fed through a peg in the stomach um, produce significant amounts of tartar, what you probably know as tartar, we call calculus. Uh, this is, is a hard um, formation, um, hard deposit that forms on the teeth, on the lower incisors particularly, can form anywhere on the teeth. Um, <clears throat> calculus itself does not cause gum disease, but by the fact that it harbors plaque, the white sticky film um, that um, contains bacteria and sugar, this is what causes the gum disease. And the presence of tartar makes it more difficult to remove the plaque. A number of studies have shown that tartar in itself doesn't cause gum disease. But um, some people are very keen to remove it completely um, because they feel it, it, doesn't, it looks rather unsightly, which I would agree with, um, and doesn't look very pleasant on the teeth. So this is something that we are often required and requested to do, sometimes in a very, very clean mouth, there is calculus forming, and the carer or the relative will say, can you not just brush all these, all the tartar off? And we can, we can not brush it, but we have to scale it off with um, scaling equipment. Um, however, it will probably uh, reoccur again in another two or three months. So that is um, a bit of a, a dilemma that we face, um, particularly when discussing with some carers and relatives. <clears throat> on occasion we find uh, small root remnants um, which are present in the surface of the gum and these um, are unlikely or almost certainly uh, will not cause any particular problems. They may well have been there for a number of years, um, however they, they may not necessarily need removing. Um, the use of general anaesthetic or sedation sometimes may not be medically appropriate, particularly in obviously the person who is very poorly. And this is something we have to consider very carefully. Um, if, if the referral is made to a uh, general anaesthetic to one of the hospitals, then that's carefully assessed. If we consider providing sedation, we would carefully assess this um, based on our experience and also at the hospital in consultation with other medical colleagues. Um, the choice of the individual patient may conflict with what would not be professionally recommended. Um, this again is a, an issue which I've mentioned and perhaps can be illustrated by the case with Ray. Um, Ray wanted to have a get his gap filled, the only way he could do is providing a bridge, but um, professionally um, placing a bridge in that situation um, with Ray not being able to really properly clean his teeth is not something that is professionally 
perhaps by some recommended. However, as mentioned, when working in the area of treating people with disabilities, one needs to be flexible, one needs to be particularly cognizant of the, of the needs and requests of the, of the patient. Soft tissue trauma is something I've mentioned already, and um, very important um, point is the carer's expectations. Um, this is all to do with communication. Sometimes carers and relatives, which I can quite understand, um, want the exceptional level of care for uh, their loved one. And this is something I mentioned right at the start that, that we hope to achieve and we will uh, do everything we can to achieve. But in some situations, it just is not possible. It's not safe for the patient and it's not something we can do. So there can be an area of conflict there and it's something that we have to, um, we have to treat and we have to react to with a great deal of empathy and um, somehow reach a, reach a compromise solution. Um, as dentists, um, personally, I haven't found this area of care uh, at all stressful. Um, I suppose I've been in it for over 40 years now, so I probably would have left if I had. Um, some people will do, so perhaps they shouldn't be in this area of care. Um, despite all this, uh, we need to be in a position where we can treat our patients carefully and we need to relax ourselves. Um, this is my rather itinerant son, um, supposedly helping with the lock gates, but deciding he enjoys looking at the sunshine instead but he's certainly relaxing. Look into the future. There are guidelines for dentists to, um, to help out with policies for um, providing care for people with HD. Training and experience of dentists is important. Um, certainly, while well, I've been in the area of um, disability dentistry for since 1980, I hadn't had an awful lot of experience of treating people with HD. And probably a number of dentists who are also working in the area of providing care for people with disabilities, so-called special care dentistry, may not have had this experience. They can transfer their skills and their competencies onto um, providing care for people with HD. However, there's nothing like um, having experience yourself. Um, the pro pro dental profession needs to give increasing support to people with HD. HD association meetings and carers as well. And it needs to provide training for dental health professionals in oral health and mouth care. Uh, we need more research and we need to improve multidisciplinary working. So these are all things that uh, we should be working on um, for the future. Um, we need to have an experienced dental team. We need to have the time. Dentists in general dental practice don't always have the time to provide adequate amount uh, adequate time to provide care. The community dental service is a service, it's a small service, it's a very small service, but it's usually manned by um, dentists who are interested in providing care for people with disabilities and are, do have the time. Uh, many of them will have sedation skills. Um, we need to have um, the clinical aspects of providing uh, well-fitting dentures. We need to have good chairs, either tumble cushion, or tilting, um, we need to provide high quality dental treatment that um, lasts a long time and is easy to maintain. Um, prevention is the key um, pre to prevent dental decay. We need to reduce the frequency of sugary foods and drinks. We need to have a high fluoride toothpaste and use specialist toothpaste and other devices. Uh, we need to find a dentist who has the skills and the knowledge and experience that is special care dentists within the community and the hospital service. Um, so education and training is vital. Experience is important. We need to have um, positive support from the dental nurse team. We need to have facilities of clinical holding and consent. Um, overall, um, dentists in this area of care need to have a positive approach. They need to be flexible and they need to exercise sound professional judgment. And that may require taking risks. Taking risks is something that's considered a little bit taboo in the, in the professions, medical and dental profession these days. My view is that uh, sometimes we have to take risks to move things forwards. 
They need to be taken in the interest of the patient. They need to be taken if um, the benefit outweighs the uh, benefit of the action, outweighs the non-action. And also they need to be taken by people who are able to cope if the situation goes somewhat awry and they are able to cope with um, this and make it um, um, deal with the problem and make it better. So these are some of the important things I feel we as dentists should be looking towards. Um, I think, um, okay, our challenges may not be easy, but we should persevere with them and um, work through them. Um, one of the things I mentioned, I mentioned finally is that you may well have questions about how to find a dentist that could cope and help you with these problems of treatment and general management. Um, you can um, go on the General Dental Council specialist lists. First of all, you need to find the postcode of where you are living. Um, the, I think the first two letters would do something like that. Go on the General Dental Council specialist list look for find a specialist by searching by register um, and then um, put your you get a drop down selection and what you want to select is special care dentistry from the drop down list and then you can search this by entering the first two letters of your postcode and the address and the details of the dentist specializing in treating people with not wit disability will come up um, it may be their personal some will are on the GDC list by home address, some by work, but will give your dentist or doctor in the area at least a name for referral. I think that just about concludes my presentation. Some of it has been rather garbled and thinking again about it. Some of the things that I've said are perhaps um, what I should not have ideally said. However, that is my personal um, presentation, and my personal feelings. And we're now at 10 to 11. I'd be very happy to answer any questions should they be required. Thank you.